with this issue of intercession and then I want to begin discussing confession then we're going to look at petition and we're going to close on engagement engagement now in the 18th chapter of Genesis we have a classic case of intercession someone praying on behalf of others and I hope that all of us have a heart for others. We have a, a burden for others. I do not know how you uh, listen to the news, but the death of people, wherever they are, bothers me. And just because something moves out of the news cycle doesn't mean I don't still feel the burden. Um, that mother in Ferguson is still dealing with the death of her child. And you, do you remember those 300 girls, 200 girls in Nigeria? Because think of it, though, that mother, those mothers and those fathers, it's, it may be out of the new cycle. It's not out of their hearts. Do you remember that airplane that just disappeared? Those families are still dealing with that. Or the airplane shot out the sky. Or when you hear that Almost 2,000 people were killed in the, in the war between Israel and, and uh, the Gaza, the Hamas. Or you hear that 1,800, 2,000 people have died from Ebola. We must understand what Dr. King tried to tell us. We're all bound in a web of mutuality. You cannot live in this life without me, and I cannot live without you. I do not know why we're so convinced that we're separate, we're islands, we're off to ourselves. No, we're not. The death of your child affects me. What tears you down affects me. So don't ever feel smug that it didn't happen to you. Because it is happening to me. And, and we must not be uh, arrogant and, and in any way joyful, even over someone's scandal. That's no reason to be, uh, to gloat. Because the scriptures say, if a brother be overtaken, you get that word, overtaken in a fault. Two conditions there. One, only let the spiritual deal with it. Ye that are spiritual, do what to that person? Restore, not tear down, not beat up, not denigrate, not expose. Restore such a one. Here's the second condition. In the spirit of Meekness, considering yourself, lest ye also be tempted. When I hear of a minister going through a hard time, I get nervous. Because if the devil is taking out preachers in, in New Orleans or in America, I'm a preacher. If the devil takes your son, I have a son. If your marriage breaks up, I have a marriage. And we feel sometimes we are insulated. No, we're not. So we pray for one another and we sustain one another and we need a heart for the world. I'm afraid that sometimes the vision of the church is too myopic. It's too small. I don't know very many churches that have two things and I pray for this one and this scares me. Two things I don't see in most churches. One, a sense of history and two, a view of the world. See, the average church cannot rise to a certain level of being because they don't have a sense of history. See, I live constantly with a sense of history. Here's how I look at it. There were people who came before me. There were people who will come after me. So the critical, crucial question is, what will I do with my period? You are writing history in New Orleans. 200 years from now, somebody's going to write what we did or didn't do. 
So I've heard the names. I don't know the men. I've heard of Freddie Dunn and A.A. A. Gundy and, and uh, 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 Percy Simpson. And they were before me. Gardner Taylor and Sandy Ray, they were before me. And that will come a group after me. But the question is, what the devil am I doing with my... But if you don't have a sense of history, it won't matter. The average person is, give me a house to live in and some food and some clothes and I'm all right. But you don't make history like that. You make history by sensing that something significant, all time with God is important. And this time in history is just as important as any other time. But I'm afraid we're going through life just stuff going on around us and no one really paying attention. That's the first thing. A sense of history. The second thing is a worldview. I love maps. I love globes because I am not just a citizen of the United States. I'm a citizen of the world. How many of us truly pray for the world? For God so loved New Orleans. No. Oh, really? No. You mean you mean there's a world outside of New Orleans? Yeah. For real? God so loved Algiers. God so loved. And our prayers ought to encompass the world. You built a church in Sri Lanka. I know you don't know about this, but we gave some money once to Bishop J. Alfred Neal from Germany. We built a church in another country. Nobody said anything about it, and that's okay, that's not the reason. But I was thinking just the other day, Pastor Bello a few years ago was standing in this pulpit, and he was talking about a minister in Trinidad, and the man lived in a house the size of a, of a, of a garage. And he moved out of that house to get into another house because he wanted the church to go forward. And they raised some money, and I told uh, him, I said, we're going to match it, and we did. And I'm told that, there, I'm told that let's just say Sunday, we could raise $1,000. Dollars in life center, we could do that at the drop of a hat. But a thousand dollars might actually build a church in Haiti or in some African countries, which means a church outside should have about 20 of them are built around the world. And we should all call them Life Center. Life Center of Haiti, Life Center of Nigeria. It's a worldview. For God so loved, say it again. And this text reveals something that we ought to see. This intercession was a major thing. When you read the Bible, don't make the Bible something that it's not. Do you know that when Moses went to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, that that was political, economic, as well as religious? Oh, yeah. Those slaves were slaves in an economic system. They talk about employment in America. Do you know that was a time when America had 100% employment? It's called slavery. This was an economic issue. This was a political issue. We've spiritualized everything. It's not just about heaven. and It's about God functioning in a real world with real people. And our prayers ought to do that way. So look at this. In, in, in Genesis chapter 18, uh, verse 20, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. So in other words, sin cries out. You hear me? Sin does what? It cries out. And because that sin is very grievous. Now, I'm not going to stop now because I don't want to get sidetracked. But do you know one of the reasons that God destroyed the world in Genesis, and I won't go there because I don't want to get sidetracked, is because the earth was filled with violence. Now, we think the only sin is sex. In the world, if you don't have sex, you save, sanctify, fill the Holy Ghost, that would have mighty burning fire. On your way to heaven, and so glad. You can be mean as a snake. Jealous, envious, haughty, disobedient. As long as you ain't having sex, you're all right. That's like chewing gum. I wish chewing gum had never been invented. Because I hate to turn on TV, see somebody on TV. No. God. But anyway, that's another subject. God saw the wickedness. It cried out. You know every time somebody dies, the Bible says the blood of the slain cries out from the ground. Listen, that sin is very grievous. I will go down. Now, this is anthropomorphic language. God sees everything. But he's saying, I'm going to get involved with it. I'm going to go down and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. If not, I will know. God says, I'm going to. Now, here's the thing I'm concerned about. Is God coming down to see if America is as wicked 
as it looks. After Katrina, we all know the devastation of Katrina. I saw two billboards that made my blood run cold. One was out on Causeway, one was in Houston. After all New Orleans went through, a billboard went up in Houston that said these words, and I told the city council, y'all going to hell. I don't know if they put it up or not, but I called them on it. Here's what it said, New Orleans, open to just about anything. Now, after this city had been baptized, and 80% of the city was underwater, and people had died, and people in the Silver Dome, and, and, and the Superdome, and in the Convention Center, and on their roofs, bodies being fished out of the water. What arrogance. Do you know what open to just about anything means? Come in and do whatever you want to do. We still don't get the message. And there was a billboard out on Causeway that said, nothing stops Mardi Gras, nothing. I said, keep playing with God here. He'll stop some other stuff. Now that we, we got a new enemy, y'all. First it was, it was, first it was uh, Al-Qaeda. Then it was Taliban. Now it's ISIS. A poll came out, and you know, this is September 11th. And by the way, don't ask me anything about the news because I don't believe anything I see on the news. I think it's the story they tell us and the story behind the scenes. So I don't believe any of that stuff about 9-11. I don't believe it. You believe what you want to believe. I am the quintessential conspiracy theorist. I don't believe anything they tell us. They give us the news and the real stuff is behind the scenes. Too much happened on 9-11, I can't explain. But for example, if bin Laden was the enemy, why was his family flown out the country? When, Mr. when the president's own father couldn't get back in the country, why was bin Laden's family? If you want to get my attention, then kidnap Aisha. But if you, want to, if you want to find me and you let Aisha go, what, what incentive do I have? Why was bin Laden's family flown out of the country? Those people on that airplane were not Iraqis or Iranians. They were Saudis. You see how y'all looking at me? <laughs> Who told all the Jews not to go to work that day in the Twin Towers? Not one Jewish person went to work that day. New York is full of Jews. But somebody, they just decided not to go to work that day? You just see how y'all looking at me. I don't believe any of that stuff. There's the news and there's the real stuff. And, and by the way, you don't want to know the real stuff. I just say, just leave us out of it. But don't insult our. That's all I'm asking you. Just, just say, it happened, now on with the show. I think we caused some of that problem over there. We caused it. See, the Middle East is different. I'm not sure they are equipped for what we call our style of democracy. And I'm wondering if we had left Iraq alone, would we be, would we be dealing with Sunnis and Shiites and ISIS? So we destabilized it, and now we're trying to deal with it. So now we have a new enemy, ISIS. But guess what? Americans say that they're afraid, more afraid since they've been, since 9-11. What? I ain't scared of ISIS. Of course, I really think we're being lured into something, too, but that's another discussion. I ain't scared of ISIS. I'm scared of America having walked away from God. I'm afraid of America that aborts babies and laughs about it. I'm afraid of an America that allows men to marry men and say it's all right. I'm afraid of America that has abandoned church and feels good about it. I'm afraid of a country that abuses a whole class of people and feel like it's all right. I'm afraid of a nation where men who make the laws make thousands of dollars a year and will not vote a minimum wage for people. That's what scares me. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Rome was not brought down by the Huns and the Visigoths. Rome was not brought down by Germanic tribes. Rome routed from the inside. Communism and ISIS is not going to destroy America. America falling out of church. Don't go to church. Ignoring God. Taking his name out in vain. Killing people. That's what's going to bring judgment on America from the inside. You should see how y'all looking at me. I ain't scared of communism or ISIS. I'm scared of a people who become godless. The wicked shall be turned into hell and the nations that forget God. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man, a family, a church, a nation, souls. That's the, am I in the book or am I just meddling? 
God came down. And the man turned their faces, verse 22, from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, listen at this. Now, this is intercession. He's talking to God. Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now, somebody who has a Bible, what comes at the end of that word wicked? A what? Ah, oh, question mark. Isn't that interesting? Aren't you told never question God? Let me tell you something. If you don't, something is wrong with your relationship. Sometimes you need to quit being so spiritual. And so deep. You need to talk to God. Sometimes things happen in your life. You ought to ask God, I don't understand this. I don't know why. Give me some insight on this. He's a father. God is a real person. God is not a computer or a machine. He's a real person. Talk to him like a person. I don't get this. I don't understand this. If you don't do that, the unexamined life is not worth living. You're not living a very productive life. Sometimes things happen in your life, you ought to question them. They ought to bother you. This man said, are you going to, are, are you going to do this? He's talking to God. He's standing up for an issue. I would, uh, 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 Alicia is in the back, and, and, and if you say this to her, it still breaks her heart. She was 11 years old. A friend was hit by a car and struck dead. I went to the funeral right here in the, over in Algiers. And her mother got up to speak. Her mother got up and I can hear it like it was yesterday. She, she said, oh church, let me tell you something. God is in the plan. God is speaking to the church. You better hear me today. God wants to show us something. All is well. I sat there in the pulpit and tears filled my eyes because I said, that's not normal. You don't lose your 11-year-old child and talk about what God is doing. Romans 8, 20, the Bible said. You, and you know what? And she had to be institutionalized for a time. She, even when she was speaking, was in the midst of a nervous breakdown. That ain't normal. You're not going to come to me and tell me that Kayvon, who plays football, has a heart attack on the field and died. And Sunday I said, let me tell you something. God said in his word. The spirit said, please, come and get me. I'm not laughing. That's not funny. Come and get me and take me somewhere because I'm in trouble. And somebody need to say, Bishop, you don't need to preach today. Oh, I'm in the spirit. I can. Come on, y'all. You're human. And you ought to deal with God like a real person. And the Lord can't help some of us because we're so used to wearing a mask we even wear one with him we're so accustomed to being churchified and sanctified well see God knows you ain't as sanctified as we think you are am I in too deep tonight this man questioned God are you going to do this listen to what happened for adventure perhaps come on Lord Look, let's talk. He said, let's talk. If there are 50 within the city, will you destroy? Will you not spare the place for 50 righteous? See, you got to understand something. It's not the wicked in the world we have to worry about. It's the saints. You are the light of the world. Don't worry about the crack dealer and the person out there. If the saints lose their salt, or if you put your lights out, see, and don't get mad because the world doesn't know you. They don't know who you are. Don't worry about it. People, yeah, you church folks. You better be glad we are. Go on down there and listen to that preacher. You better be glad you got a preacher in town. I take this thing seriously. You know what I regret? Now, don't, you're going to think I'm totally stupid, so this is just, this is my off-the-wall talk. I'll always regret that I wasn't in the city when Katrina hit. I will always regret that I was across the sea. And I've stayed in town for every storm since Katrina, and I don't plan to leave again. Somebody said, why? The police don't go. The firemen don't go. I think the man of God ought to be here. Because I'm just stupid enough to believe. See, I'm on one level, you on another. You see me as the preacher, as Bish. I see myself as the man of God planted on the West Bank. And I'm going to stay here because I'm just stupid enough to stand here and say to the storm, in the name of Jesus. The man of God is in town. You don't hear what I'm saying. 
if Joshua could tell the sword to stand still. You mean I can't speak to a storm? You don't use your faith. Now here's the problem with Joshua 10 and 13. It says the sun stood still. That's not accurate. The sun doesn't move. Actually, God did something worse than that. The sun spins every 24 hours. It's around, that's a, that's a day. It takes 365 days to go around the sun. That's a year. So what God did was he took the North Pole and the South Pole and suspended he, it, either he slowed down its rotation or stopped it. But if he stopped it, he had to regulate gravity, trifocal force, centrifugal force, and inertia to keep everything in place. Preaching myself happy here tonight. He suspended everything because a man said so. And I think I can stand here and say, in the name of Jesus, the man of God is in New Orleans. Spare the city. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Glory to God from on high. Mm. So, well, so he bargained with God. He said, now, look, look at this. That be far from thee, after this manner, verse 25, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. Look at the next sentence. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? You know, he said to God, he said, what I have learned of your character, that's not you. But here's the problem. This man never had the Pentateuch, the Hexateuch, the, the law, the prophets. He never met Isaiah, Ezekiel. He never met John or, or Paul. He never even met Jesus as we know him. But he knew enough about God way back there to say, that ain't like you. This is why you need to get so deep in the word. You know the character of God. You know what God is like and you can pray out of what God is like. In other words, that ain't you. That's not your character. You don't act like that. But when you get into the word, you'll know him well enough to talk to him like that. And Abraham drew near and said, you're going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? That, the judge of all the earth. And that's a, that's a sermon right there if y'all wanted. The judge of all the earth will do right. I just gave y'all a sermon. I better preach it because if you don't, I'm, I'll preach it. And the Lord said, look, and the Lord said, now I'm going to give you the J. Douglas Wiley Taylor translation of verse 26, all right? And God said, okay, Abraham, let's talk. You want to challenge me? Fine. If I find 50, I'll spare the city. This man made God say, you're on. Let's look at it your way. Y'all missing this. He prayed so until God said, all right, you're on. Don't you want to pray to God say, all right, you got my attention. Let's talk. Let's work this thing out. Abraham answered and said, now, uh, he said, now, I've taken it upon me to speak to the Lord, so I'm just dust and ashes. I haven't forgotten my place now. I know who you are. I know who I am. I'm not confused about that. But peradventure, look, I'm a little concerned. What if I could only find uh, mm, 45? God said, for 45, I won't destroy it. He said, now, okay, now, Lord, since we're talking, since I've got you bargaining, since you're at the bargaining table, peradventure, what if I can't find but 40? God said, you're on for 40. This man is interceding. Y'all get this? And he said unto him, now, don't get angry. Don't lose patience with me because I'm really pushing. I'm pushing the envelope. But peradventure, um, 30? He said, now, look. First 30 what? Now, look. Uh, I'm really, really pushing this. But peradventure, don't get upset, don't get impatient with me. 20? God said, 20, you're on. He said, now look, this is going a little bit far. But look at the patience God has with Abraham. Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak one more time. But if I can only find 10, God said, I'll do it for 10. He interceded. He wanted the wicked city saved, and all he was asking for was 10 righteous people. All the stuff that was going on in Sodom, 10 righteous people would have saved the city. Church, I, I'm, I'm not being solicitous when I say this, but I thank God for you, because you very well may be saving New Orleans. The praying that you do, and we're getting ready to have a church fast. It's going to be three days. I'll tell you more about it later. When you fast, when you pray, 
when you open your Bible, when you serve the Lord, the Lord sees you. You are the salt that's arresting the bacteria that's destroying this city. You are the light that's shining in this dark city. You go to Bible study. You go to Sunday school. Don't worry about the other folks. Don't worry, don't, don't worry about them. The Lord can use ten. Amen. One can chase. Two can put. So got, all I need is two right here and I got 10,000 on the run. So that means there's enough in here. To, if you add up everybody in here tonight, never mind the place being full. So if, if New Orleans has 300,000 people and two can chase 10,000, I just chase the whole city with what we got in here right now. I'm going to preach a sermon about that. See, it's, it's coming pretty soon. And the sermon is from the Old Testament where God says, tell people who can't go to war. See, the problem is we've tried to take too many people to war. God said, if they're scared, go home. If they just bought a house, go home. If they just got married, go home. Because their attention is divided. Now, the church is only supposed to send out a few people to actually do battle. Did you know that? Moses sent 12 spies. Joshua sent two. You'll get that later. Only a certain number of people have. And see, some people need to stay home not because they're not a, a, a say, but they're scared. And fear is contagious. So is doubt. Do you know that people are not content uh, to, to keep doubt to themselves? You sit in church with people, and I, I hear people talk while church is going on. I don't believe it, but they say people make comments while church is going on. Pastor say something, they say, I don't believe that. It's hard to keep negativism to yourself. Now, people can keep positivism to themselves, but if something is negative, they can't help. I said, church, let me tell you something. By December 31st, we're going to have a new church and $100 million in the bank. Watch this. Hmm, you believe that? <laughs> and then you won't keep it to you. So you got to tell somebody else, he tripping. If you really believed me, we'd all be on our feet clapping and praising God. And the folks who would get up clapping and praising God, see, he didn't put his, his angel dust on them. They believe that foolishness. That's why when the Israel marched around Jericho, he said, don't talk. Shut up. I can hear it now. What are we doing this for? This doesn't make sense. They say how to bring down no wall. I, thank you. I'm tired. My feet tired. I work today. I got to cook tonight. My children got homework to do. <laughs> so, 10. Thank God for those. But let's take intercession to another level. Go all the way to the New Testament. I want to put intercession in a whole new light. I want you to see something, and I want to encourage you with this. Repeat after me. I, I must be must an intercessor. intercessor. I must pray for others. But look at this. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. You have it, say amen. You don't have it, say wait. wait, wait. Hurry up. Uh, 826. Look at this. Likewise, the Spirit, that's capital S, also helps our what class? What's an infirmity? Weakness, illness, problems, struggle, foibles, failures, difficulties, you name it. So we must have some, right? He couldn't help what you don't have. He helps our infirmities. Now watch this. He helps, repeat after me, the Spirit, the Spirit helps, helps my weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. You can get in some situations and have no idea what you should pray about. But it's not up to you. But the Spirit, now that's a, that's a mistranslation. It should be himself, not itself. Himself, because he's a he, not an it, makes intercession for us. Do you know that the Holy Ghost intercedes for you? He prays for you. Now, now, Paul said to Timothy, we have a mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But the Spirit is in heaven right now praying for you. He sees your struggles, your weaknesses, your problems, your difficulties. See, we talk too much about us being committed to God. Listen, you could not be committed to God if he were not committed to you. Yes. Commitment starts with God. The covenant is with God, not with you. When Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Young people, they used to put this wooden yokes on, on uh, uh, oxen to plow with. Now they have combines and tractors. But I found out, but the heaviest part of the yoke is on one side, and it's light on the other side. In other words, one is really doing the pulling, the other is just to balance it. The heavy part is on Christ, not on you. 
I was taught in my old church, go get saved. Well, the problem with that theology is if I get it, then I got to keep it. Because sometimes I want to quit. And sometimes in my mind, I do quit. But let me tell you something. Did you not know that when you quit on God, he doesn't quit on you? When you say, I quit, he said, you may quit, but I didn't. He's not going to quit on you. He's committed to you. That's why you can be committed to him. He prays for you. He sustains you. He upholds you. Why is it that what some people have been through, and you've been through more than, less than they've been through, and you're still here, and they committed suicide? Because he's holding you. The Holy Spirit is making intercession for you. He's praying for you. That's why you make it. Because he intercedes on your behalf with groanings. This is mysterious language, which cannot be uttered. Now, some people make a mess of that. Because they say, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What are you doing? I'm groaning in the spirit. Now, first of all, stop. It says groanings which cannot be uttered. He's groaning on a whole level you can't even hear. It's not for humans. So you just groaning, you just groaning. Now, if you want to groan, groan. That make you feel better. But don't call it groaning in the spirit. That, that means there's a communication between God and the Holy Spirit you wouldn't even understand. He's talking in a language and a level you wouldn't know. That's how committed God is to you. God's determined that you make it. He's determined that you succeed. God is not producing failures. My prayer for you is that you will recognize the gifts and the talents that God has put in you. And you have no right to die with those talents unutilized. And let me know how I know that God is not finished with you and that you still have talents. Are you still breathing? Now I'll make a deal with you. You have a right to quit, give up, don't use your talents, don't do anything if you wake up dead. Now if you wake up dead, don't come back to Life Center. Don't have any more dreams. Don't have any more visions. Don't eat no more etofe, no more gumbo. Don't go to Mardi Gras and don't come to Life Center. We're going to put you in one more time and get you out of here. But if you're still living, don't you know there's a champion in you? There's a winner in you. There's a leader in you. We don't have enough leaders in our church. Too many people are following. Too many people are putting the load off on somebody else. God didn't just send you here to look at me. I'm not that good looking. I'm pretty good looking, but... I'm not that good looking. He didn't send a room full of people to watch me do the work. What about your gifts and your talents? Some of you should go back to school. Well, I'm 60. Go back to school. There's no school that has an age limit. Except you shouldn't. Don't go back to kindergarten. Now you'd look funny. But the dream you have, if you can't write the book, get a ghostwriter. Speak into a tape recorder. If you feel led to write a song or start a ministry... God wants to produce that person he made you to be. And some of you, if you sit here tonight, you would admit, you know you're not living the life you're supposed to be living. You're living beneath what God made you to be. And the thing that I fear about my congregation more than you living in sin is you're living beneath what God made you to be. I ain't worried about sin. Watch this. I say that. I don't be the mean about it. But Christ died for sin. But watch this. Christ can do something about sin, but he can't do anything with missed opportunities. If you tell a lie, he can forgive you. If you sleep around, he can forgive you. But if you miss your chance to do what he sent you here to do, what can he do about it? And nobody can do it but you. I don't care who sits on the platform. I don't care who ushers at Life Center. I don't care who's sitting next to me. But the job he called you to do, can't nobody else do it. And if you leave it undone, the church will suffer and you will suffer and you'll give account in it for the judgment. So every one of you who have talents you're not using for God in this church, the church is suffering, you're suffering, and you're going to stand before God. You're going to say, why didn't you use it? Well, I didn't like so-and-so. Some folk in here don't like me, but I ain't going to stop preaching. I mean, everybody likes me. I know we cool. We, we, you know. Everybody and everybody in the world don't think I'm all of that. I've been called everything but a child of God. Some of it false, some of it true. Don't worry about what's true or what's false. <laughs> but a charge to keep our head. A God to glorify. A never dying soul to say, fitted for this, to serve this present age. My calling to fulfill. 
Oh, may all my powers engage to do my master's will. I'm going to do what he told me to do. Frown at me, I'm going to preach. Come to church, I'm going to preach. Stay at home, I'm going to preach. Go to another church, I'm going to preach. Keep your type, I'm going to preach. Puncture my tire, I'll walk home. But I ain't going to stop preaching. Because one, because if I stop, you're going to suffer, I'm going to suffer, and I'll have to stand before God and explain why I didn't do my job. Do you know why the church doesn't function any better than it does? Because half of the church is paralyzed. Now, all my body functions just fine. But if I have a stroke and half of me is paralyzed, y'all going to have to help me get to the platform. Probably put some kind of chair for me to sit in. I'm going to have a stick. My mouth might be twisted. I'll be able to function, but with great limitations. Half of our church is functioning, working, serving, going, doing. The other half is, and we got to drag. Teach Pastor Wiley Taylor. We got to drag a leg that won't work and hands that won't move and a mouth that don't talk. Half of life sentence is, is on all cylinders. The other half come to church and go home. And we got to pull them along. So we got to pick up stuff. And we got to move stuff. With half the body. And I'm tired of it. Because I'm wearing out the saints. That are working. The choir is exhausted. Everywhere I go they go. Deacons, preachers, they might go. Choir. If I go to hell, the choir's going. Some of y'all, let the choir go. Why y'all look at me like that? Thank God for the choir. Because if I say go, they're going. And what insults me is that some of you act like the choir don't have jobs. I got to go to work. Ain't many retired folk in the choir. I got to take care of my children as if they don't have children. You should see how y'all looking at me. I got things to do. I'm sure the choirs are pretty active. I think most of them go to work. So when they get off work, they got to rush home, get dressed. But you say, well, let them go. I'm in life center, but I don't do nothing. So I got to drag a bunch of folk that ain't helping me. I'm supposed to score touchdowns, build a church, save the city, and have my body. Y'all wearing me out. I should look up and say, good God, my whole church is with me. I can't even get the whole church to clap. It took me five times on the Sunday to get everybody to clap. Okay, so you can't go to the hospital, so you won't say, almost cuss. At least you could clap. The Lord, the Lord caught that. <laughs> and I ain't going to tell you where I was Sunday. I ain't going to talk about that. I ain't going to tell you because I don't want you to know. But I remember the time I would come back telling you how they responded to me. I ain't going to tell you that because I don't mean nothing to you. All I had to do was just stand up and they got happy. I read my text. They tried to take it from me. And by the time I got to the roundhouse, it was awful up in there. I can stand in the pulpit at Life Center, squall, gargle, chew, jump, spit, turn around, take my coat off, take my shirt off, take my shoes off. Some people are like, what's he doing? And it makes me feel funny when I go somewhere else and they act like I'm the hottest thing since baby. You look at me like, what's he doing? That makes you feel funny, y'all. When every woman compliments you but your wife. Every woman say, oh, you look good today. You some good looking man. Your wife be, oh, he looks that all the time. I ain't worried about him. Y'all ain't listening to me. And sometimes it makes me want to say, well, maybe I ought to go where I'm celebrated and not tolerated. Because sometimes I want to feel like I got wind beneath my wings. <laughs> How did I get into that? Listen to this. And he that searches the hearts, know what the mind, know the mind of the spirit. See, God uh, searches our hearts and he knows the mind of the spirit. 
because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So he knows your mind, he knows your problem, he knows your struggle, and he knows what's in the mind of God. And when he prays for you, he brings those two together. You have to succeed. You have no choice. That's intercession. Let me say a word about confession. Turn to Psalm 51. Now, some believe that David didn't write Psalm 51 because theology and Bible religion evolved over a period of time. David made the statement, you don't desire sacrifice or if I would give it. It was believed by scholars that that sentiment was meant for later in the Israel's theological development. So they thought maybe David didn't write this. I believe he did write it. I believe he wrote it. I'll tell you when he wrote it. At the time of the year when kings go to war, David stayed at home. He was in his middle age. At the, the kings went to war in the spring when the ground got dry so the chariots could roll. In the winter, they couldn't go to war. At the spring of the year, men went to war. David stayed at home. The Bible said he was, he got up off of his couch, get it? In the afternoon, he'd been lounging all day. Should have been out there fighting. And he's out there walking on the balcony, chilling. And he saw what Beyonce called it, bootylicious. That thing was fine as she wanted to be. Ooh, and she was bathing. And she was olive colored. Her skin was brown and flawless. Her hair was long and down her back. She had red ruby lips and eyes, olive eyes, slightly deep set. Her cheeks were properly chiseled. Her fingers were long and luscious, painted to perfection. And just as he looked, she put one leg out of the tub. And the sun caught the water beating on her. It looked like gold on her legs. And he said, who is that? And the first warning came. It said, that's Bathsheba, the wife. That's the warning, the wife. Stop, David. Stop. God always gives you warning before you mess up. Stop, David. Stop. The wife. Sin for her. Fixed her a sumptuous meal. Seduced her with his playboy charm. Took her to his bedroom. And did they have a night of love and passion? Sent her home. Kept on being king. A few months later, when her body changed, she sent a text message to the king. She did the, that test, you know. OMG, I'm pregnant. David said, I know it's mine because her husband ain't been home. Sins for Uriah brought him into the palace. Spread before him delicious food. Jambalaya, gumbo, etouffee, alligator, can I get a witness, greens and chicken, potato salad, and peach cobbler, and delicious wine. They laughed and they talked, and Uriah got drunk. He said, go home now and... Go see that fine thing you got for a wife. All right, Sire, he staggers out of the temple, out of the palace, goes to his house and falls asleep at the door. He's a better man than me. And David woke up and saw him sleep. He brought him back. Uriah, you didn't go into your wife? He said, it's not fair for them to be lying on the ground in war and I'm having the joy of my wife. He's a better man than me. Yeah. He said, okay, I'll do it another time. Gets him drunk. He does it a second time. All he had to do was go have marital relations with Bathsheba. He could then put the baby on him. It happens today, y'all. Mama's baby. It ain't the first time. Ain't nothing new. Now he's angry. But he's also nervous. 
Because when you get pregnant, you keep being pregnant. And she gets more pregnant every month. And David is nervous. And, 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 and the cover-up is always worse than the crime. So he, he hatches a scheme. Writes a letter. Tells, I think it was Joab. Put him in the heat of the battle. And when he gets in the heat of the battle, withdraw all the forces that he might die. Uriah goes to fight for David, his commander in chief. Fighting for David, looks up and there are no soldiers around him. And they put him to death. And David said, Phew, I dodged a bullet. Told Bathsheba, come to the palace. You're the newest queen. Sit at my table, lay in my bed next to me, Queen Bathsheba. It's handled, it's taken care of, it's cool. I got it done. It's a scary thing to lay next to the man that killed your husband. And, 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 and he, whew. but when you read the 32nd Psalm, the 32nd Psalm describes what David went through during that year he didn't confess. He said, my bones got old. My joy was gone. My life wasn't what it was. Tried to go to church and sing, this is the day, but it wasn't working because he knew he was wrong. And finally one day, a door opens. Into the palace walks the man of God named Nathan. And Nathan looked at David and said to David come back next week David yes, sir.